Okay, I think we'll probably make a start if that's okay with everyone. Um, so, hi everyone, welcome to this um, Alcohol Health Alliance session on alcohol harm and ethnicity. Um, my name is Andrea Mohan and I'm a, a lecturer at the University of Dundee. Um, I'm primarily involved in alcohol research and I'm really looking forward to today's session. So before we begin, um, I'd just like to remind everyone, first of all, that this event is being recorded. So if you don't wish to be on the recording, please do turn off your camera. Um, and we also ask if you could update your um, Zoom name um, to let us know who you are and your organization. That would be appreciated. So um, for today's session, you're welcome to post any questions that you have within the, the Zoom chat box at any time. Um, if you do have any um, conflicts of interest to, to declare, um, or if you receive funding from the alcohol industry, please also indicate that um, in writing when you, when you post your question as well. Um, we will allow our two, speak, our two speakers to go first um, before we then take questions at the end. Um, and I think that probably would be it for housekeeping, if, if I'm not sure. Please do ensure that you are also on mute as well. Um, and when we, when we start to ask the questions, then you can unmute yourself to ask your question. So without further ado, I'd like to just first introduce our two speakers that we have today. So our first speaker is Dr. Laura, Laura Goodwin, who is a senior lecturer in mental health at Lancaster University. She conducts research on the co-occurrence of mental health and alcohol problems. With expertise in understanding the complexity of these issues in trauma exposed populations. And our second speaker today is Jazz Rai OBE, who is the founder and chair of the Seek Recovery Network. Following his own experiences of alcohol addiction and recovery, Jazz set up the charity to help people from the Punjabi Sikh community who were not accessing mainstream services. The Sikh Recovery Network provides a space for people to share their experience, strength and hopes with people in the Punjabi Sikh community and beyond in Leicester, Birmingham, Coventry and London. So thanks very much. And I would like to hand over now to our first speaker, who's Dr. Laura Goodwin. Um, and over to you, Laura. Great, thanks, Andrea. Can you see the slides okay? Yes. Yeah, okay. brilliant. Okay, so yeah, thanks for inviting us to present at such an interesting session. Um, I'm Laura Goodwin. Um, I was going to be presenting with Joanne Puddifat, but unfortunately she's had to, she's had a family emergency at the last minute, so you'll just have to have me for the, for the presentation. Um, so I'd like to just really acknowledge Joanne's um, you know, leading contributions in the work that I'm going to be presenting um, and also acknowledge the other co-investigators from uh, the University of Liverpool and King's College London. Um, so I've got quite a lot of experience in um, conducting research looking at the links between people's mental health and their alcohol use. Um, and as part of this study, which was funded by Alcohol Change UK, we're specifically looking at the links between mental health and alcohol use in racial and ethnic minority groups. And that's because there really isn't that much research out there at all on understanding how this association might differ across different um, ethnic minority groups. So in terms of what I'm going to cover in the presentation, I'll provide a bit of background about what we already know about alcohol use and also about mental health in racial and ethnic minority groups. Um, I'll provide an overview of our research project, which has three um, four elements, um, three research studies, and we're going to be presenting on the first two research studies. And just to say they are preliminary findings, um, so it's all quite new, uh, new data, um, but I'll be talking you through both the quantitative and the qualitative findings. But just to provide a bit of background, um, then this graph is showing you data from the 2014 Adult Psychiatric Morbidity Survey, and it's showing the prevalence of 
um, non-drinking and low-risk drinking, also hazardous drinking, and then harmful and dependent drinking, and how that might differ across different ethnic groups. And what you can see from this graph is that in all of the ethnic groups, the highest proportions of these populations were either non-drinkers or low-risk drinkers. And specifically, the, it was in the Asian and Asian British group that we have the highest level of non-drinking and low-risk drinking. Um, if we look at hazardous drinking, the highest level is in the white British group. And then for harmful and dependent drinking, um, it's most prevalent in the white British, the white other, and also um, the mixed other group. Um, one of the issues with data like this is that these you'll be able to see these categories are quite broad. So if we really want to understand what's going on, we need to ideally use more specific categories for um, looking at people's ethnicity. And also just to state that even though the prevalence of alcohol use may be lower in some racial and ethnic minority groups, we still we don't know whether they might still experience greater harms from their drinking because of the fact that people are um, less likely to both um, seek treatment or complete treatment and people from racial and ethnic minority groups may also have poorer treatment outcomes. In terms of what's known about mental health and ethnicity, then we do know that there are some differences in the prevalence of mental health problems across different ethnic groups. So if we focus on common mental disorders like depression and anxiety, um, then there isn't a difference in males, but for females, there is a difference by ethnicity. So for example, common mental health problems are most likely to be reported by women from a black ethnic group. Um, and additionally, in terms of the support that people get, we also know there's differences by ethnicity. So people from racial and ethnic minority groups are less likely to receive treatment. So specifically, less likely to receive psychological therapies. And they're also less likely to be referred for psychological therapies. And they may report more negative experiences. So what all of this means in the context of our research is that people from um, ethnic minority groups may be less likely to be getting the, the support that they need around their mental health. So moving on just to briefly talk about what's known and the different theories around what the association might be between mental health and alcohol use, then there's three sort of key theories, and this relates to also the direction of the association. So the first theory is that alcohol use may increase the risk of someone developing mental health problems, and that's through both the biological effects, but also the social consequences of drinking. So for example, someone who's drinking at a very heavy level may become more socially isolated, and that may have a negative um, impact on their mental health. The other theory that is that if someone's mental health gets worse, they may be more likely to increase their alcohol use. Um, and that's because they may be using alcohol to cope. So that's in line with what's called the self-medication hypothesis. And then the final theory is that there may be common risk factors for both. So for example, genetic and environmental risk factors that increase the risk of both mental health problems, but also alcohol use disorders. So in terms of um, studies that have tried to look to understand more about which of these theories is likely to be um, the strongest, then there is some evidence that there's more, that it may be more likely that a decline in your mental health uh, results in an um, increase in alcohol use. And that's more what we're going to be focusing on in our work because we're looking at the level of alcohol use in people who have a mental health problem. So this diagram is just sort of theorizing why um, we might, why people from racial and ethnic minority groups may be more likely to use alcohol to cope. And the reasons for this is that there may be greater stigma around mental health problems. There may also be more of a lack of trust in services. And I'd showed you previously that people are actually less likely to be referred to mental health services. So this may mean that there's more people who are has sort of trying to deal with the mental health problem by themselves because they haven't been referred for support or they, they haven't wanted to go for support. And so therefore they may be 
um, people who are coping by self-medicating with alcohol or other substances. And so in terms of what isn't known from the current research, we don't really know how the, how the association between mental health and alcohol use may differ across different ethnic groups. And even more than that, we don't completely know what the prevalence of alcohol use is across different ethnic groups. And that's because most published studies have focused on just a single source of data where the numbers for different ethnic groups tend to be lower. Um, so we're going to talk about how we've tried to deal with that in our research. Um, and also what we don't know much about is how alcohol use is sort of screened for and treated in mental health settings and how that might differ across different um, ethnic groups. So in terms of the study that we're currently doing, which has been funded by Alcohol Change, and it's got four work packages, and we've got a PPI and project advisory group that have been informing all aspects of the project development and interpretation. And so the first work package is sort of the epidemiological work, um, looking at the association between mental health and alcohol use across different ethnic groups. And that's um, combining data from a range of um, population data sets from the UK. The second work package is a qualitative study, looking at um, people who are from ethnic minority groups who have a mental health problem and looking at their sort of experiences and motivations for either not drinking or for drinking and understanding more about how that might fit with and um, then getting support for their mental health. And then the third study, and I'm going to be focusing on the presentation today on work packages one and two, um, but the third study which we're about to start is looking at how um, harmful drinking is treated in community mental health care settings and whether that might differ for different um, ethnic groups. And then we're going to finish by developing health promotion materials that can be used in mental health settings. Okay, so to move on to um, work package one. So this is the data study. This is using existing population data. And you can see the range of data sources that we're combining. And the reason that we're combining these data sets is because um, if we relied on a single um, sort of study, we wouldn't have enough people in different ethnic groups. So we're combining them using a sort of meta-analysis approach. And the questions that we want to ask in these sources of data is what is the prevalence of non-drinking and also increased risk drinking across different ethnic groups? And then how is alcohol use associated with psychological distress in different um, ethnic groups? So just to give a bit of information about the measures um, and to say that we have selected data sources where they've either oversampled different ethnic groups or we've chosen a wave from the data sources where they've kind of oversampled. So we've tried to use the best data that we can to get the numbers for ethnicity. And we're trying to use the specific categories as the data allows for ethnicity. But one thing to say is that when we combine the data sources, because there's different categories in different data sets, it means we're not able to look at all categories of um, ethnicity, which is a limitation. So for example, the mixed ethnic group, we've had to drop that for now from the analyses because it would be so variable across the different data sources. So just wanted to mention that. In terms of looking at mental health, we're using a broader measure of psychological distress. So questionnaires such as the general health questionnaire or the CISAR, and they're basically looking at whether someone meets criteria for symptoms of common mental health problems such as depression and anxiety. And then alcohol use has been um, assessed using the audit C questionnaire, and we've used a cutoff of five for increased risk drinking. Okay, so moving on to the data and what this graph is showing you and it's combining data from the APMS surveys from the CELCO um, survey, the next steps and understanding society. And it's showing the prevalence of non-drinking, low risk drinking and increased risk drinking. 
And what we can see is the prevalence of non-drinking is highest for Pakistani and Bangladeshi ethnic groups. And the prevalence of increased drinking is highest for the white British, white other, and then also black Caribbean and Indian ethnic groups. So we can see here that by using these more specific categories, we can see quite a difference between the South Asian um, ethnic groups, which won't be seen with the previous sort of um, broader categorizations. So now moving on to look at, now this is looking at the association between someone's mental health and their alcohol use. And this is looking specifically at non-drinking. So what this graph is showing you is how does the prevalence of non-drinking compare between people who don't meet criteria for psychological distress in the blue and people who do might meet criteria in the red. And we can see that for most ethnic groups, actually, there isn't much difference in the prevalence of non-drinking um, between those who do and don't meet criteria for distress, but there is for the white British group. So we can see here that if you meet criteria for distress, you're more likely to not drink um, if you're white British. Moving on to the data now, which is looking at the prevalence of increased risk drinking, and this may also be called hazardous drinking. Um, and we can see, um, again, there's not huge differences for some of the um, ethnic groups, but we've got a statistically significant difference for the Indian group. So people of an Indian ethnicity who meet criteria for psychological distress are more likely to drink at an increased risk level compared to those who don't meet criteria for distress. And also um, we can see that for the black African group, those who meet criteria for distress are more likely to drink at an increased risk level, but there, this isn't statistically um, significantly different. Okay, so moving on to a quick summary of that, um, that data, then we can see that by using the broader categorizations, it does mask some of the differences. So we can see, for example, in the South Asian groups, that Indian people from an Indian ethnicity seem to drink differently to those from a Pakistani or Bangladeshi group. Um, and we showed that the Indian ethnic group who met criteria for psychological distress were more likely to drink at hazardous level than those without distress. And there was also some evidence comparing the Black Caribbean and the Black African groups that even though increased risk drinking was more common overall in the Black Caribbean group, there wasn't the same association with psychological distress. But for the Black African group, those meeting criteria for distress were more likely to drink at an increased risk level. So just to give you a bit of an overview then of work package two, which is a qualitative study. And this is looking at how um, people with a mental health problem from racial and ethnic minority groups may use alcohol and how their use of alcohol may change as they get support for their mental health problem. And so this is really uh, in the early stages. And so I'm just gonna present some very preliminary data. Um, so for this study, we've been recruiting people from a number of mental health community organisations, and we want to interview both non-drinkers who previously drank and also people who are drinking at hazardous level and above. And we're still trying to recruit to this study. So if anyone is able to um, got any ideas or can help at all with recruitment, that would be much appreciated. In terms of the preliminary findings from the interviews, then it's shown that um, people with a mental health problem discuss both drinking for enjoyment, but they also did mention drinking to cope with previous trauma and that the alcohol use was often hidden from families. And there were some negative experiences of mental health support that were discussed. And some people had had formal support around the alcohol use, which I'd found really helpful. Participants reported that there was stigma both around mental health, but also around alcohol problems. And they felt that stigma was even greater for having a problem with their drinking. 
So moving on um, to give a summary of what we've found so far in the quantitative and qualitative data. Um, so we've shown that hazardous or increased risk drinking is most common in white British groups, but also in white other, in um, black Caribbean and in Indian ethnic groups. And we've shown that there is evidence for an association between mental health and increased risk drinking in in different ethnic minority groups. So specifically, we found evidence in Indian and Black African groups. And we may not have seen these associations if we'd used broader ethnic groups, for example, if we'd combined all of the South Asian ethnic groups. And the qualitative findings have suggested that there is stigma around both getting support for mental health and also for alcohol use disorders. And it's maybe greater for alcohol use and particularly from family and from local communities. So in terms of the implications, and I've discussed the fact that even though we've combined a range of representative national surveys, we've still had issues with the numbers. And that's due to the numbers of ethnic minority groups who've been recruited to these surveys. So it really needs to be a research priority that future data collections do really oversample ethnic minority groups to ensure that we're able to look at what we need to and get the evidence that we need. We also want to find out more about how alcohol use is screened for and treated in mental health services and how that might differ across ethnic groups. And that's something that we're going on to do. And also we need to develop more health promotion materials around alcohol, which are accessible and which can be used in mental health services because we have shown evidence that people from a range of um, ethnic groups will may use alcohol to cope. And there's also a need to ensure that specialist alcohol services are accessible for all different ethnic minority groups. And importantly, that there's links between the mental health services and with the specialist alcohol services, which we know that there always isn't. And so these issues may be even more compounded if someone's from an ethnic minority group. And also just to say, if anyone does have any ideas about recruiting people for a qualitative study, then we'd really appreciate your advice. Okay, so I just wanted to thank Alcohol Change UK who funded this project and for everyone who's supported the study so far and through the project advisory group. And um, here are the contact details for myself and Joanne. So please free feel free to get in touch. And Joanne also really sends her apologies. She wasn't able to um, present today. Okay, thank you. I'll stop sharing now. Thank you very much, Laura, for that really interesting presentation. And I'm sure we'll have a, a few questions after, but I'd like to just move on to <clears throat> our next speaker now, which is Jazz Rai. So Jazz, would you like to um, take over? Yeah, hi everyone. Um... Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, everyone for this opportunity to share my thoughts and views on what you're doing. Um, as, you, as you introduced me in the, uh, uh, the beginning, I'm a recovering alcoholic myself and uh, struggled with alcohol for the best part of 20 years, alcohol addiction. Um, my last drink was in uh, January 2009, and my first uh, meeting, or first acceptance of my addiction really was in March 2009, when I first attended my first recovery meeting. And I think what, what um, I find interesting about this report, um, what uh, Laura has just shared is, is time and time again, we see the same thing that comes up is stigma. And I think I find in our community, not just the Punjabi Sikh community, but in the Asian community as a whole, that um, addiction, whether alcohol addiction or drug addiction is still a massive taboo and a massive stigma in our communities. And the only way we're gonna get rid of that is by talking more openly about it. You know, people like myself sharing our journeys with the community. But I also believe that we need to work in partnership with organizations such as yourself, with some of the service providers and charities such as Norcoa. Um, I think the research shows that there is a link between mental health and alcohol addiction. That goes without saying. I mean, in our community, in the Punjabi Sikh community, we're having a massive problem. 
you know, with uh, alcohol addiction and suicide in particular. And once again, we need to work collectively with organizations like this, like yours, but also with Turning Point and some of the other um, service providers that are working up and down the country. And I think if we're working in isolation, we're not getting that message across. And this is something that we've tried, the Seat Recovery Network has tried to get across, across to these services that we have to work together. And one of the biggest battles for these organizations, I think, is, is to get in into the community, into the heart of the communities. How do they get into the temples? How do they get into the communities that are really reluctant to talk about this? And I think we can act as a bridge for that. Um, I know from my experience working with Turning Point, I do apologize, I've got hay fever. Sorry. Um, work, we'd started the meetings in Derby, the recovery meetings in temples, which at the time people thought we were crazy and um, you know the temples aren't gonna allow this. But from Derby where I am, um, the community here kind of, my addiction to alcohol was well documented in the community because I was heavily involved with the community. But the response we had from the temple was amazing. And because of the work that we was doing in Derby, Southall, which is probably one of the largest communities, uh, Sikh communities outside of the Punjab, um, actually gave me a call and said, Jazz, can you, we want you to do the same here. So with the, that was the next uh, seat recovery network meeting that was started in Southall, but then it went into Birmingham, Leicester, Coventry, and we're working towards two more in um, Yorkshire, working with Leeds, Bradford and Huddersfield together, but also one in Kent. Um, there is a quite a large Sikh community there as well. And I think when we, when we started the meetings in Leicester, uh, one of the Turning Point community uh, support workers came across the poster on, um, on Facebook, on the social media, and he contacted me and he was like, he was quite surprised. He says, how have you managed to get into this, into the temple? So I shared how and why, and it was great really because, because then they decided to work together with us. And only last week I attended a, a turning point conference with some of their senior management team in Birmingham. And it was great because I was on a panel there as well, but we could share the work that we were doing together and highlight where the improvements have come. And because of the work we're doing with Turning Point in Leicester, they've had a 50% increase of the Punjabi Sikh community coming forward and seeking help. And one of the things that we've also done this year as well, and unfortunately we've had to fund this ourselves. We've not had the benefit of our cold change supporting us uh, financially. We've also done a, a survey at the Sikh Recovery Network. We're working together with the British Sikh Report who do, who've got more experience with this. But we're hoping that this data that we're gonna get will break down um, the drinking habits and also where the gaps are in the existing services for our community. But also, we've also seen some of the preliminary findings show that the connection between um, alcohol use and the mental health. And we're quite happy to share that with you. Um, but once again, I think um, what I noticed in Laura's um, presentation was well, that even some of the, the research that you've done, if we can work together, not just with the Sikh community, but all the minority communities as well, that if we can be involved and give our knowledge to you. And unfortunately, small charities like ours don't have the resources that some of the larger organizations have, but they also don't have the expertise that we have and can get into those areas of the community where, where, where they unfortunately won't even be allowed to go in um, because of the, the way the community is. And I think for, for the Seat Recovery Network, we're just scratching the surface at the moment with some of the work we're doing. Yes, we're getting the people coming forward, we're doing presentations in temples. We're working with people like Narcoa. We just did a presentation and a talk in Coventry at the Sikh temple in Coventry. And it was received really well from the community. And one of the things that we tend to miss in our community is the effect alcohol has on the families. And, you know, it was only dawn it came to me when I was in it actually a meeting in a recovery meeting when someone was sharing the impact his alcohol had on his family. And I know research shows that for every 
addict, whether it's alcohol or drug addict, alcohol or drugs, that five other people are affected. But in the Punjabi Sikh community or even the Asian community, you know, I was counting once, there was about 25, 30 people in my family that were affected because of the extended families from my um, siblings to my mom, to my grandma, uncles, aunts, my in-laws. You know, I, I just, you know, the amount of people that got involved to try and help me. So I think we, we need to, the education in our community is massive. We need to educate our community around alcohol addiction and the, um, and the pain and misery it causes, but also the, the help that's there. But I think the connection now that what you found with uh, mental health and alcohol addiction is, is becoming more and more apparent in our community. But it's, it's great that people like our, our organization, but there's others as well in the Sikh community, organizations within the community that are doing some valuable work, especially around mental health. But I think for me, and I keep coming back to this, but we need to do more collectively, because like I said, we don't have the resources that you big organizations have. And until we can work together and maybe do research like this together, we, we really aren't gonna get the results that we want. Um, we hopefully, our survey, the British Seat Report and the Seat Recovery Network, um, that is, um, uh, we've come to an end to that now and we're getting the data together and we we're launching that hopefully in October and we're looking at launching it in Parliament so that we can actually give a voice to those people who have been suffering, but also highlight where the gaps are in the existing services. For, for not just the, the Punjabi Sikh community, but for the other BAME communities as well. So that some of the organizations who are getting large pots of funding that can actually go into those communities. I mean, it's quite staggering sometimes when, when I, you know, I get phone calls from Southall, still organizations there don't even have Punjabi speaking support workers to, to assist some of the um, people that are accessing those services and they're having to call us. I mean, it's great that those services are also referring people uh, from those specific backgrounds to us as well, so that we can support them as well. And, uh, you, know, we're, you know, with some of these organizations, we're all working collectively together to get the help those people need. So, yeah, I mean, I, um, I didn't do any, I don't, I'm not a great fan of uh, slides and presentations because I think there's more value in the questions and answers. Um, I'm going to keep it short because I'm struggling a bit with my behavior. All of a sudden, it's just come on. So apologies for that. But I, I'm happy to answer any questions for anyone. But for me, uh, just to summarize, really, it's, it's to work together. And we're doing some great work with Narcoa. Um, I've got a, a meeting with uh, Narcoa tomorrow. And we're, we're planning some more events in the temples. And uh, once upon a time, talks like this would never have been allowed in the temples because even our elders in the Sikh community didn't want to accept that alcohol or drug addiction is a problem in our community. But today, they are actually inviting us in to the temples and we're having recovery meetings in the temples. And that, that's great, you know, that, that our community is acknowledging this. And we're also working with other communities in Leicester. We're working with a Muslim uh, group and we're actually sharing ideas and how we can work together and deliver some of these uh, workshops, talks, presentations together so that we can be more effective in our community. And we might be different through faith, but you know, a lot of the Asian communities, their cultures and the backgrounds are very similar. So some of their drinking habits and the, um, uh, the drug use is very similar. And the reasons behind that are, are, very, are very similar as well. So yeah, so I'm quite happy to answer questions and uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that, Jazz. Um really really interesting um hearing about your your experiences but also the work that you're doing within your communities um and so i think well we will just open up for questions now for both laura and for jazz so um if you have any questions um please feel free to i guess raise, raise your hand function and coming if, if if you would like or you could alternatively um post questions on to the the, the chat. Um, so I'll just see if anybody has any questions, first of all. Um, yes, so Zad Nakua, would you like to come in? Mm 
Nako, I sorry, I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name okay. Hussein, Hussein. Hussein, okay. sorry. Yeah, sorry. Oh, okay. Sorry. sorry about that. I'll okay. just put in the organization name at the end. My okay. last name's Jamil. Ah, um, sorry about that. <laughs> it was a it was a question really about the visibility of services. When when you were talking, Laura, you talked about um kind of mistrust of services and um lack of referrals to services. Um, my, I guess one of the things that I've noticed in working in the drug and alcohol field and being a person in recovery myself um, is that often people don't know that the services are there. They're not they're not visible in the same way. I, I worked in prisons quite a lot, and a lot of people within prisons, you know, when you look at the prisons, I was in charge of drug services for the London prisons, and we had, you know massive numbers of people from black and ethnic minorities in prison but when you looked at the services in those prisons they were very poorly represented and yet they were also kind of um, highly represented in the kind of security side of things so you know restraint and, and all of that and when I spoke to people often and in the community they would say you know we just didn't know they were there most of the time um, and I wonder how how Big, big an issue visibility is. I know that Jazz is working with peers over at NACOA where I'm working as well to, to make, you know, to help make services more visible, to make help more visible. Um, is it just a question of stigma and mistrust and waiting for a referral? Or is there also an issue with how services make themselves visible to other parts of the community? Yeah, no, definitely. I think that's a really important point. And that's, and I think it's also about the connect between services and how integrated services are. So we're particularly interested in sort of people who are using mental health services. If they're also drinking heavily, is that being identified? And are they being sort of um, appropriately kind of um, supported to go and get, you know, um, help from a specialist alcohol or drug and alcohol service because I think often people might just be given the details to kind of self-refer or something and if someone's already experiencing mental health problems as well that might not be enough so that's something we want to look at but yeah I think definitely like it's about having better awareness and awareness across it awareness in communities but also across services as well so that people are, if they're being seen by one organization you know there's the right links and there's the awareness so that people are seen by multiple organizations and that there's some integration as well across those services okay jazz do you would you have do you have anything to, to say as well or I agree with what Laura says, and I, I do think that we need to, we, we're just trying our best, and I think that one of the best ways to do this is, is to go into the community. Uh, unfortunately, some people don't even know that they have alcohol and drug services in their area. They've never actually accessed them, and some people, but I think there is a big taboo and a big stigma attached. And when we get people, you know, we say, well, go and talk to your GP. And they're afraid that if they go to the GP, that's going to be marked down on their medical record and they're going to be. So there's a lot of um, uh, fear as well around this. So, you know, whether um, addiction or mental health. And, and I think, you know, we just need to educate people more. But but I think some of the services that, um, sorry, I think Hussain mentioned that I think that, you know, in some of these services, the prison services, there more needs to be done, really. You know, we focus on the wrong thing sometimes. Okay, thank you very much. And there's an anonymous question for you, Jazz, um, and that is, how did you get into setting up the recovery network? Um, it was it was myself and some other um, alcoholics that used to go to AA, Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, although I, I still go to AA, you know, even after 13 years, I still I go to my meetings. But um, we found that there was, they weren't culturally empathic, that we, we didn't get that cultural identification. 
um, because I was involved with the Sikh temple at the time, um, one or two of them said, Jazz, why don't you ask the temple and see if we can have the meetings in the temple? And that way, people from our own community, when we get more identification, we, we can talk a bit more openly about the challenges we face in our communities. And that's how it came about, really. Just started here in Derby, and then it just replicated what we're doing in other towns and cities. Okay, that's that's really interesting to know. Um, I think I was I was recently speaking to my own ethnic minority hub um, uh, in my council, and the, you know, one of the questions you were asking about, you know, how do you, I suppose, get people from different communities to actually start talking about alcohol and, and potential alcohol problems? And I think what you just said there, um, identity sounds like it's it would be very key to starting that conversation um it's very interesting um i will just read a so i'm seeing susie mcclue's co comment from scottish families um just agreeing with hussein's point about the impact on on families um but noting that um with this the, the scottish report that they report that ethnic minorities are, are underrepresented in that survey but she's posted that link there um, in the chat for the Scottish Families Report, if anybody else is interested in, in looking at that. And we have a question from Sadie. Sadie, I don't know if you want to, to come in and ask your question, if you would prefer me to read it out. Feel free Hi. to come in. Hi. Yeah, I can read it out. Um, bit of a research -free question for Laura, great talk. Thank you. And also thanks to Jazz. Um, you mentioned difficulties combining um, across all the different surveys that you've included um, for some ethnic groups, um, including mixed. Now, I might be wrong, I don't know, but is that quite a big group of people? And if that's the case, are there any insights from the separate surveys that you might be able to even tentatively share about that group? We will. I haven't got it to, to share now, but it will be in the it will be in our report. So what we're going to do is show the date, the individual um, data from the separate data sets where we don't have to drop the groups. And but obviously for the combined data that I've shared today, that's where we've had to have those sort of um, more where we've got sort of um, more replicable data across the different data sources so yeah it's an important point and it's something that we will we will be presenting but yeah it's a shame that there's such differences in the way these questions are asked across the different data sources and um, but i think things are improving so for example for understanding society their categorizations were were quite a bit better so yeah thank you Thank you. Um, we have another question for Jazz, and that is, what was your experience of keeping the outreach um, during the pandemic? Should I say that again? Uh, what was your experience of keeping the outreach going during the pandemic? Yeah. Um, Zoom. Zoom was a great, um, a great friend, really. And because people couldn't get to the face-to-face uh, -face meetings, uh, we started uh, Zoom meetings. And that was a great, really did. I mean, they're, they're still going. We continued with them. So we were having two meetings a week in uh, COVID, one on Monday and one on Wednesday. Um, one was uh, from the Birmingham group and then one was from the Southall group. But what they've actually done now is combine the two and they just have one on a Wednesday. So, you know, just keeping uh, in touch with people uh, through Zoom, but also AA meetings were available on Zoom. And the, I do believe the, um, the fellowship grew in COVID because some of those meetings are still, um, you can still access a lot of meetings via Zoom still today. Okay, that's great, thank you. Um, and another question for you, Jazz. <laughs> this is from Sarah. She's unable to come on because her mic is in, um, she's in the library actually at the moment, but she's asking um, about any gender differences that you see in, your, in the work that you're doing, if, if they exist. Yeah, definitely. Um, we're, what we're finding is more and more women are coming forward uh, to, to seek help. Uh, more and more women um, are struggling with alcohol. And we found this was uh, more uh, obvious uh, throughout COVID, you know, working from home, the drinking, you know, 
some women were coming home usually would have come home late in the evening and had a drink but they were starting to drink earlier um before they knew it they had had a, a bottle of a wine by three o'clock and by the end of the evening it, 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 it you know there'd be two or three bottles but um but one of the problems for women is um the men struggle to come forward and seek help because of the stigma um and so the women find it even harder because the women you know are supposed to be stronger they support the families bring the kids up but you know the the, the good thing is now but through the, the work we're doing more and more women are coming forward and we've actually got women uh, peers who are sporting other women especially in areas like birmingham coventry and southall that women who have got good recovery behind them now that are able to support other women and, and sponsor them and help them through the fellowship go through their step work but yeah I, I think what we're actually really finding now is more and more women are coming forward and um and admitting that they have a problem okay that's, that's interesting thank you um and a question actually for both um jazz and laura and that's what do you think treatment organizations could do to ensure that people from minorities, ethnic minorities feel that they can go there and feel welcome and understood and like the service is for them as well. I'll, I'll go. Um, I think that for me, a big part of them is uh, for the treatment centers and the service, but they, they have to be more culturally empath empathic. There needs to be that more empathy. And, and for our, uh, people from the ethnic communities and the Bain community, to access some of the, they have to be more culturally empathic. They have to understand the needs of um, the ethnic groups. And I think that's one of the reasons that um, people from our backgrounds is, is, a, is a barrier for them to access these services. And so I think really, and it's a, you know something I raised at Turning Point um, last week, that their staff needs to be trained. You know, if they don't have enough people from the Asian community or the black community, working there then the appropriate training needs to be given to that that staff so they they are culturally um a bit more you know sensitive around those people mm -hmm. laura do you have anything to add um, no i i agree with what jazz said and yeah i think it's about how those services are set up and made more accessible and having yeah different people um from different ethnic backgrounds working in services as well as really important um, and yeah and with our work I guess we're interested in um, the links between mental health and alcohol services and making sure that kind of alcohol screening or um, have it, talking to someone about their drinking is happening systematically and that there's not there's not sort of assumptions made that someone might be less likely to drink that because they're from a particular ethnic group which might mean that someone's drinking harmfully but that's completely missed if they don't want to share that information themselves so that's something that we really want to find out more about mm -hmm. and following on from that question um jane sorry jane robinson has asked about what do you think public health and local authorities can do um can help how can they help and be involved either one <laughs> i guess what yeah i'm kind of saying similar things but i think one thing relating to our work which is just around better integration of services and that's really important across kind of um mental health you know social services around um alcohol services and making sure that there are that we're removing the barriers for people who may be more reluctant to go and get support and um, through through the way services have been set up and everything so yeah i think that's really important and hopefully with sort of integrated care systems and that's something that can be addressed more and we can think about how services are set up to be accessible for for different groups and not just more accessible for white British groups. Mm -hmm. Jess, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I, do, no, I totally agree with what Laura says, but I also feel that some of these services need to be less fearful and need to approach more community groups as well. And where they can't deliver is, is reach out to the community groups and, and charities like ours and, and to ask for support 
and sometimes you, you've got these big organizations big charities that just aren't reaching out to smaller community groups and i think they need to be um you know brave enough to go out and say where they can't deliver say yes we can't do that and we need support from this you know the community okay thank you um we have another question i think it probably might be for both both laura and jazz but it's about why does ethnicity play or what role probably does ethnicity play in alcohol use and abuse um abuse patterns sorry i think it comes down to cultures mm -hmm. and, I, and i'm in the uh, punjabi Sikh community there's a massive drink culture I and mean, if you go to a wedding and if you you know a group of guys are sitting and one of them says i don't drink it's almost sort of frowned upon so it's a very masculine thing in the Punjabi city and even some in, in some of the other Asian communities. But um, and I think that's one of the, the reasons why it's such a big problem in our community. And I, I think, you know, when I talk about cultural empathy, um, when you go to the fellowship of AA and other fellowships or even service providers, they don't understand that. So I think that's one of the reasons having these culturally empathic groups is a big help. Yeah, and I think where alcohol use is more norm normalised, then it's easier for it to be hidden as well, isn't it? If someone's drinking at a more harmful level, it might not be noticed and they might also, people try and hide the fact that their, you know, their alcohol use may have increased. So it's about um, ensuring that people can get support and that those conversations around alcohol are sort of broadened and that more people are having those conversations and I agree with what Jazz said before about ensuring that people across a range of services have the kind of skills and know how to ask people about their alcohol use and I think that's an area where um, you know we can do more around training and stuff to ensure that we don't have those divides because people don't want to ask someone about their drinking because they're worried about what they would do if someone discloses that you know they're drinking at a more problematic level or like the issue that was mentioned before about awareness of services they're not sure where someone should be referred to so that could that's something that can partly be addressed through training obviously a range of other things as well but I think that's something that we can do better with mm -hmm. okay thank you for that um and for you Laura um were you able to look at any geographic variation in the data or other factors, example, age and gender? Yeah, um, not at geographic areas other than some data. Most data sets are national. Um, the num it's, it's frustrating, really, that even when we've combined like six data sources, we've got incredibly small numbers. <laughs> Um, and so even when we stratify by gender, we've got tiny numbers that we couldn't report in a paper because they're so small. And so I think that's um, you would think that if you know if you're using so many data sources that power wouldn't be an issue, but it is. And it's because we need to do more to kind of oversample different ethnic groups so that we've got sufficient numbers in the data sources. So, yeah, really important things to look at and we want to and also to look at religion and migration status but it's a problem when we start stratifying the data of course yeah that's yeah. A very challenging yeah appreciate that thank you um i'm just looking at the comments so sarah burwood has just posted a comment that she's doing some similar work um and really keen to work with anybody who is also interested and, and she's posted her email address um, there, if, if anyone's interested, um, and Sarah is also another Sarah is also doing some similar research, research to you, Laura, um, in South Asian and British Asian women in particular, and keen to speak. So, she's asked if you could email her, and her email address is there. Um, do does anyone have any other questions for either Jazz or Laura? Laura is wondering from your qualitative data if you if you would be getting any more information about maybe like drinking habits and drinking patterns across the different groups, I suppose. Is that going to be coming out more from that data? 
Yeah, hopefully, yeah, and we're really interested in how that use might change, like before someone's got support for their mental health problem and then after they've got support. And so, yeah, we're really interested in looking at that, but we're still kind of in the stages of recruiting for that study. But yeah, really important to look at. Mm -hmm. And is your study just, is your study UK based or is it England based? It's UK based. Um, well, England, yeah. England. And some okay. of the study, some like the study where we're looking in community mental health services that would just be in the Northwest. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because we're just looking in the particular trust. Okay. Yeah. That's great. Okay. Um, Niraj is also thanking both you um and also putting out their email address for anyone who's interested in, in getting in touch so a lot of looks like a lot of our participants are doing similar work um which is great we definitely need a lot more research in this this area okay so if we don't have any further questions i think um if anybody does have any further questions for either jazz or laura um, you can please um, email Poppy from AHA, um, and it's her, her email address is poppy.hull at ahauk.org. I think we might, if you could post that in the chat for anyone. Um, but I would like to just thank both Laura and Jazz for very interesting presentations um, on a, a very much under research but very much needed area. and just um, like to, you know, encourage you to continuing that, that great work and um, Jazz looking forward to hearing about the, the report when you present the, the findings um, in Parliament. I think that will be really interesting. Okay, so um, finally, so um, on, if on behalf of um, Alcohol Health Alliance, if anyone um, would like to, to join, um, please do contact Alcohol um, Health Alliance at info at ahauk.org. Um, if you're interested in joining or would like to find out more about AHAs, we're contacting Alcohol Harm. So thank you again for both, um, to both Laura and Jazz. Thank you for AJ for, for hosting and then allowing me to chair the session. It was really enjoyable. Um, and I'm wishing everybody the rest of an enjoyable day and week. Thank you.